Hello, and welcome to another episode of ADHD History, the history of the world told in no particular order. I'm your host, Xander Millette, here to enrich your minds with some more fascinating information. Today, I'm going to take you back to Tudor England once again. In this episode, though, we explore the lives of three often overlooked figures, Edward VI and Mary I, the children of the notorious King Henry VIII, and the sad tale of the Lady Jane Grey. Despite their royal lineage, their stories are often overshadowed by the dramatic events surrounding Henry VIII's reign and the subsequent reign of Elizabeth I. I talked a bit about Edward in my last episode, but mostly about his mom and way more about his dad. So today, we're going to get a lot more detailed about Edward himself. Edward came into the world on October 12, 1537, at the opulent Hampton Court Palace, the long-awaited son of King Henry VIII and Queen Jane Seymour, his third wife. Jane's joyous news was spread far and wide through personally signed letters, heralding the birth of the heir to the throne. Edward's baptism swiftly followed on October 15th, with his half-sister, Lady Mary, serving as godmother, and his other half-sister, Lady Elizabeth, holding the sacred chrism over his head. Tragically, Queen Jane's happiness was short-lived as she succumbed to postnatal complications on October 24th, a mere 12 days after Edward's birth. Henry VIII wrote to Francis I of France that, quote, Divine providence hath mingled my joy with bitterness of the death of her who brought me this happiness. End quote. Edward was born in good health, much to the joy of his father. Contrary to earlier beliefs, recent historians have challenged the notion that Edward VI was a frail child. Although he faced a life-threatening fever at the age of four, he generally enjoyed good health, aside from occasional illnesses and poor eyesight, until the final six months of his life. Henry set rigorous standards for security and cleanliness in Edward's household, empathizing his son's importance as this whole realm's most precious jewel. Visitors described the young prince as content and happy, not surprising as he was provided with extravagant toys and luxuries, including his own troupe of minstrels. I would imagine it would be like that Family Guy sketch, where Peter had his own theme music follow him around. (laughs) Edward's environment was opulently grand. His chambers adorned with exquisite Flemish tapestries, and his clothing, books, and tableware embellished with precious gems and gold. Sharing his father's interest in military affairs, Edward often appeared in portraits wearing a gold dagger with a jewel-encrusted hilt, reminiscent of Henry VIII. The pages of Edward's chronicle brimmed with enthusiasm, chronicling English military exploits against Scotland and France. It recounted gripping adventures, including John Dudley's daring escape from potential capture at Musselburgh in 1547. From the age of six, Edward began his formal education, concentrating, as he recalled himself in his chronicle, on the learning of tongues, of the scripture, of philosophy, and of all liberal sciences. He received tuition from his sister Elizabeth's tutor, Roger Asham, and from Jean Belmain, learning French, Spanish, and Italian. In addition, he is known to have studied geometry and learned to play musical instruments, including the lute and the virginals. He collected globes and maps and, according to coinage historian C.E. Chalice, developed a grasp of monetary affairs that indicated a high intelligence. Edward's religious education was probably chosen by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, a leading reformer, and the men in charge of overseeing his education were themselves, quote, reformed Catholics. By 1549, Edward had written a treatise on the Pope as Antichrist and was making informed notes on theological controversies. Now, I've read this treatise, and if Edward actually did write this all on his own, I'm very impressed. 
I sure as heck was not as smart as this kid when I was 11. I was way more focused on hiding the books I wanted to read in my school's library in the air vents so nobody could check them out before I did. <laughs> Edward was educated with the sons of nobles, in what was a form of miniature court. Edward was more devoted to his schoolwork than his classmates, and seems to have outshone them, motivated to do his, quote, duty, and also compete with his sister Elizabeth's academic prowess. On July 1st, 1543, Henry VIII signed the Treaty of Greenwich with the Scots, aiming to seal peace through Edward's betrothal to the seven-month-old Mary, Queen of Scots, who was the granddaughter of Edward's aunt and Henry's sister, Margaret Tudor. The Scots, weakened after their defeat at the Battle of Solway Moss and the death of their ruler, James V, were in a vulnerable bargaining position. Henry demanded that Mary be handed over to be raised in England. However, when the Scots rejected the treaty in December and renewed their alliance with France, Henry was infuriated. In April 1544, he instructed Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, to invade Scotland with brutal force, resulting in what became known as the Rough Wooing, the most savage campaign launched by the English against the Scots. Despite Edward's immersion in his studies and the political machinations surrounding his betrothal, his childhood was not devoid of leisure. He relished moments of respite in the sprawling gardens of the royal estates, where he found solace in the company of his tutors, who nurtured his rapidly increasing intellect. It was during these tranquil interludes that Edward's fascination with the natural world took root, sparking a lifelong passion for botany and horticulture. In 1543, Henry extended an invitation for all three of his children to spend Christmas with him, signaling a reconciliation with his daughters, whom he had previously illegitimized and disinherited. The following spring, he restored them to their place in the succession with the Third Succession Act, which also provided for a regency council during Edward's minority. This newfound family harmony was likely influenced by Henry's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, whom Edward deeply admired and referred to as his most dear mother, Edward expressed his gratitude to his father and stepmother for their New Year's gift of their portraits in a letter dated January 10, 1547. Shortly after, on January 28, 1547, Henry VIII died. Edward was informed of his father's death, along with his sister Elizabeth, while residing in Enfield. They were subsequently taken to the Tower of London, where Edward Seymour was announced as protector. Henry VIII was buried at Windsor on February 16th, in accordance with his wishes to be laid to rest alongside Jane Seymour. As Edward VI ascended to the throne amidst the winds of change brought forth by the Reformation, the coronation ceremony symbolized the dawn of a new era for England. Westminster Abbey, adorned with banners bearing the emblems of the Tudor dynasty, served as a backdrop for the solemn rites of investiture. The tiny figure of the young king stood resolute before the altar, his brow adorned with the royal diadem, a symbol of his divine right to rule. Yet beneath the veneer of pageantry, the specter of religious upheaval loomed large. The break from Rome and the establishment of the Church of England marked a seismic shift in the nation's spiritual landscape. Gone were the days of papal supremacy and allegiance to Rome. In their place rose a burgeoning sense of national identity, intertwined with the burgeoning Protestant faith. As Edward VI took the oath of allegiance to uphold the supremacy of the Church of England, the echoes of Martin Luther's teachings reverberated through the hollowed halls of Westminster, heralding a new chapter in the annals of English history. Henry VIII's will, drafted with the intention of establishing a regency council to govern during his son Edward's minority, has sparked historical debate over its authenticity and final provisions. Critics argue that individuals within the king's inner circle may have influenced either Henry or the will itself to serve their own interests, leading to a notable shift in the privy chamber's composition, favoring the reformist faction. Following Henry's death, 
a lavish distribution of lands and honors ensued, facilitated by a, quote, unfulfilled gifts, end quote, clause in the will, allowing executors, notably Edward Seymour, to allocate assets to themselves and other court members. Despite the absence of a designated protector in Henry's will, the executors, diverging from its provisions, vested substantial authority in the Duke of Somerset shortly after the king's passing. Somerset's appointment as protector was supported by 13 out of 16 executors, indicating a joint decision by virtue of authority of Henry's will. Somerset likely engaged in negotiations with executors, offering rewards to secure their backing, including figures like William Paget and Sir Anthony Brown. Somerset's rise to power, backed by his military successes in Scotland and France, was further solidified by letters of patent from his nephew, King Edward, granting him near king-like privileges to appoint members to the Privy Council and govern largely by decree. Historian Geoffrey Elton characterizes Somerset's ensuing governance as autocratic, with the Privy Council reduced to a mere formality for endorsing his decisions. Somerset swiftly assumed power, backed by loyalists like William Paget, while facing potential opposition from figures like John Dudley. Yet his most significant challenge arose from Chancellor Thomas Reesley, who opposed Somerset's authoritarian control over the council and was dismissed over corruption allegations. However, Somerset's greatest adversary proved to be his own brother, Thomas Seymour, who sought to expand his influence through clandestine schemes, including a secret marriage to Catherine Parr. Their plots were foiled when Catherine discovered Thomas's advances towards Lady Elizabeth, resulting in his arrest and execution for treason. Meanwhile, Somerset's military achievements, particularly in Scotland, showcased his prowess. Yet his focus on the Scottish conflict became untenable as financial strains mounted and strategic setbacks occurred. A French assault on Boulogne in 1549 forced Somerset to rethink his military strategy, marking a pivotal moment in his tenure. In 1548, England witnessed a wave of social unrest culminating in armed revolts from April 1549 onward, driven by various religious and agricultural grievances. The most significant uprisings occurred in Devon and Cornwall. Known as the Prayer Book Rebellion, they were sparked by the burden of Protestantism, and in Norfolk, protesting the intrusion of landlords on common grazing land. A notable aspect of the unrest was the belief among protesters that they were acting within their rights with the support of the protector against landlords who were seen as lawbreakers. This opinion echoed throughout the country, not limited to Norfolk in the West. Somerset's role in the uprising's perception stems partly from his series of liberal and sometimes contradictory proclamations, as well as the activities of commissions he dispatched in 1548 and 1549 to investigate complaints related to land enclosures. Led by John Hales, these commissions addressed issues such as loss of tillage and encroachment of sheep flocks on common land, framing the problem of enclosure within the context of Reformation theology and the concept of a godly commonwealth. Local groups encouraged by the commission's findings took matters into their own hands against offending landlords. King Edward's Chronicle attributes the onset of the 1549 uprisings to the dispatching of these commissions aimed at dismantling enclosures. The events of 1549 marked a turning point in Somerset's tenure, as the disastrous outcomes were perceived as a glaring failure of governance, leading the council to squarely blame the protector for the turmoil. In a damning letter to Somerset in July 1549, Paget expressed the council's collective disapproval of his actions, lamenting Somerset's failure to swiftly address the unrest and administer justice effectively. By October 1st, Somerset became acutely aware of the growing threat to his authority and issued a proclamation seeking support while securing the king's person and retreating to the safety of Windsor Castle. Meanwhile, a united council publicly criticized Somerset's governance, empathizing that his power derived from them 
rather than Henry VIII's will. Subsequently, Somerset was arrested on October 11th, and the council brought the king back to Richmond Palace. Edward outlined the charges against Somerset in his chronicle, including ambition, negligence in military affairs, and self-enrichment. In 1550, John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, emerged as Somerset's de facto successor, leading the council. Although Somerset was temporarily released and reinstated to the council, his attempts to undermine Dudley's regime led to his execution for felony in January 1552. Edward somberly recorded his uncle's demise in his chronicle. This poor kid. <laughs> Both of his uncles tried to use their familial relationship with him to make themselves powerful. Greed went to their heads, and so they lost them. <laughs> Historians have debated Somerset's legacy, comparing the efficiency of his rise to power with the ensuing mismanagement of his rule. Initially praised for his populist proclamations, recent opinions have painted Somerset as an overbearing and inept ruler, lacking in political acumen and administrative competence. Contrary to previous opinions, the Earl of Warwick, later Duke of Northumberland, was once viewed as a self-serving opportunist who prioritized personal gain over the welfare of the crown. However, since the 1970s, historians have reassessed his regime, acknowledging its administrative and economic achievements. He is now credited with restoring the authority of the Royal Council and stabilizing the government following the chaotic period under Somerset's protectorate. Warwick's rise to power was marked by a rivalry with Thomas Reesley, Earl of Southampton, whose conservative backers sought to reverse Somerset's religious reforms. Warwick, however, capitalized on King Edward's strong Protestant beliefs and asserted his influence by positioning himself closer to the king, ultimately assuming control of the privy chamber. Despite initial attempts by Southampton to discredit Warwick, Parliament's decision to free Somerset in January 1550 paved the way for Warwick to consolidate his authority and purge Southampton and his supporters from the council. As Edward matured, his involvement in government affairs became increasingly pronounced, though historians have debated the extent of his actual decision-making authority. Edward established a council for the estate at the age of 14, personally selecting its members and actively participating in weekly meetings to deliberate on matters of utmost importance. Within the Privy Chamber, Edward collaborated closely with influential figures such as William Cecil and William Petra, exerting significant influence, particularly in religious matters, where his staunch Protestant conventions shaped council policy. The Duke of Northumberland employed a markedly different approach from Somerset, prioritizing procedural control and consensus within the council to legitimize his authority. Unlike Somerset, who relied on his blood relation to the king, Northumberland strategically appointed council members from his faction and expanded his family's presence in the royal household to solidify his dominance. His management style, described by the historian John Guy, resembled that of a quasi-king, with a focus on bureaucratic efficiency and the pretense of Edward assuming full sovereignty, rather than asserting near sovereignty as protector. Northumberland's pragmatic war policies, while criticized for perceived weakness, aimed to address England's financial constraints and internal stability. He negotiated a peace treaty with France in 1550, agreeing to withdraw from Balloon and recall English garrisons from Scotland. Recognizing the economic strain of prolonged conflict, Northumberland pursued domestic measures to curb unrest, appointing Lord's Lieutenant to oversee localities and bolstering revenue collection efforts alongside William Paulet and Walter Midney. Despite initial setbacks, such as debasing the coinage, Northumberland's regime eventually stabilized the economy under the guidance of Thomas Gresham. Confidence in the currency was restored by 1552, leading to reduced prices and improved trade. The regime also tackled widespread embezzlement and implemented reforms to revenue collection practices, laying the groundwork for Tudor economic recovery, which continued into Elizabeth's reign. Northumberland's religious policy mirrored that of Somerset, empathizing a robust program of reform. 
Despite Edward VI's limited practical influence, his staunch Protestantism compelled a continuation of the reforming agenda, spearheaded by trusted figures like Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Under Cranmer's guidance, a series of religious reforms transformed the English church from a Catholic-influenced institution to one firmly rooted in Protestant doctrine. The resumption of church property confiscation, notably through the dissolution of chantries and monasteries, not only enriched the crown, but also redistributed wealth to new owners, reflecting the intertwined political and religious nature of church reform. Historians remain divided on the sincerity of Somerset and Northumberland's religious convictions. However, King Edward's devout Protestantism is well documented, with accounts of his daily scripture reading and enthusiasm for sermons. Depicted as a figure akin to the biblical Hosea, Edward's zeal for religious reform sometimes manifested in priggish anti-Catholic sentiments, as demonstrated by his urging Lady Mary to forsake foreign dances and merriment. While Edward initially adhered to Catholic practices, his exposure to Cranmer and reformist influences eventually led him to advocate for the imposition of, quote, true religion in England. The English Reformation faced resistance from traditionalists and zealots alike, with Cranmer trying to establish a uniform church service in English through the Book of Common Prayer. The 1549 edition of the book, intended as a compromise to bridge theological divides, fell short of satisfying either camp. Traditionalists lamented the loss of cherished rituals, and reformers complained about lingering popish elements. The prayer book rebellion in 1549, resulting in thousands of deaths in Devon and Cornwall, underscored the chaotic nature of religious reform in England. Despite the brutality of the rebellion, it ultimately failed to derail the course of the English Reformation, as later events would demonstrate the enduring spirit of Protestantism in England. From 1551 onwards, the Reformation progressed further under Edward's personal influence as supreme head of the church. Responding to critiques from reformers like John Hooper and John Knox, as well as influences from continental theologians like Martin Brucher and Peter Martyr, Cranmer spearheaded additional reforms. The consecration of more reform-minded bishops expedited the process, culminating in Cranmer's revisions to the Book of Common Prayer in 1552. These revisions, accompanied by the 42 Articles, clarified reformed practices, particularly regarding the communion service, effectively abolishing the Mass, and solidifying the English Church's transition to Protestantism. Despite these advancements, Edward's untimely death halted further implementation of reforms. In February 1553, Edward VI fell ill, and despite temporary improvements, his condition deteriorated rapidly by June. Concerned about the Catholic succession of his half-sister Mary, which would imperil the English Reformation, Edward opposed her extension. He devised a plan, inspired by his father Henry VIII, to alter the succession, bypassing his half-sisters in favor of his first cousin once removed, Lady Jane Grey. Married to Lord Dudley, she was designated as his heir in a document known as My Device for the Succession. In this document, Edward outlined a detailed succession plan, prioritizing the descendants of Francis Grey, Jane Grey, Catherine Grey, and Mary Grey in succession. He stipulated that if the male heir reached the age of 18, they would assume full rule and governance. If under 18, their mother would act as regent until they came of age, with the counsel of a selected group. In case of the mother's death before the heir turned 18, the realm would be governed by the council, with important matters opened to the heir after reaching 14 years. If Edward died without male issue, Lady Frances Grey would act as regent, followed by her eldest daughters and then Lady Margaret Grey. In the absence of a male heir, Lady Frances or her successors would govern until the birth of a male heir, with the child's mother assuming regency. Edward's plan also outlined procedures for replenishing the council in case of vacancies, ensuring stability and continuity of governance. This carefully crafted succession plan aimed to safeguard Protestantism and avoid the Catholic succession of Mary, 
securing the future of the English Reformation. In the final document, both Mary and Elizabeth were explicitly excluded from the succession due to their previous declaration of bastardy under Henry VIII's reign, a status that was never reversed. This exclusion was based on legal grounds, as both sisters remained illegitimate in the eyes of the law. The decision to bypass them in favor of Lady Jane Grey directly contradicted the provisions of Henry VIII's Third Succession Act of 1544, leading some historians to criticize the alterations as bizarre and illogical. Despite these complexities, Edward VI's intent was clear, to prevent the Catholic succession of Mary and ensure the continuation of Protestant rule in England. In early June, Edward VI took personal charge of refining his succession plan, overseeing its drafting by lawyers and personally signing the document in multiple places. On June 15th, he summoned high-ranking judges to his sickbed, forcefully instructing them to prepare his plan as letters patent to be passed in Parliament. Edward then had leading counselors and lawyers sign a bond in his presence, committing them to faithfully execute his will after his death. Chief Justice Edward Montagu recalled that objections to the plan were met with threats from Northumberland, who asserted the necessity of compliance. Eventually, over a hundred notables, including counselors, peers, archbishops, bishops, and sheriffs, signed the document, although some later claimed they were coerced. As Edward's health declined, foreign diplomats speculated about attempts to exclude Mary from the succession. France, wary of a potential Habsburg presence on the English throne, engaged in secret discussions with Northumberland, indicating support for the plan. Despite widespread popular support for Mary, diplomats believed Jane's establishment was plausible. Historical interpretations of the succession plan have evolved. While it was once seen as solely Northumberland's scheme, many historians now attribute its inception and enforcement to Edward himself. Edward's fervent evangelical beliefs and his conviction in the rightness of disinheriting his half-sisters were significant driving forces behind the plan. While Northumberland and other advisors may have played roles, Edward's determination to shape the future of England was paramount. Despite brief periods of improvement, Edward VI's health continued to deteriorate, with symptoms including difficulty breathing and coughing up discolored substances. By June, it was clear he suffered from a terminal condition, likely a separating lung tumor. Edward made his final public appearance on July 1st, appearing thin and weak, scaring the public, and died on July 6th at Greenwich Palace, aged 15. His burial at Westminster Abbey on August 8th was intended by a somber procession of mourners. The exact cause of his death remains uncertain, with theories ranging from tuberculosis to acute bronchopneumonia. Rumors of poisoning circulated, implicating figures such as the Duke of Northumberland, but no evidence supports these claims. Edward's burial place was unmarked until as late as 1966, when an inscribed stone was laid in the chapel floor by Christ's Hospital School to commemorate its founder. The inscription reads as follows, In memory of King Edward VI, Buried in this chapel, this stone was placed here by Christ's Hospital in thanksgiving for their founder, 7 October 1966. Born to Henry Grey, 1st Duke of Suffolk, and Francis Brandon, Lady Jane Grey received a humanist education, becoming proficient in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Influenced by her tutors, she became a committed Protestant, corresponding with reformers like Heinrich Bollinger, she had two younger sisters, Lady Catherine and Lady Mary. Jane Grey was known for her preference for academic pursuits over traditional activities and endured a strict upbringing. She once lamented to scholar Roger Ascham about the pressure to perform perfectly in every aspect of her life, facing harsh taunts and threats for any perceived inadequacy. That poor lady. Despite the challenges of her upbringing, she was surrounded by esteemed scholars and intellectuals, and she eagerly immersed herself in the pursuit of knowledge, delving into subjects ranging from classical literature to theology. Around 1547, Jane moved to the household of Henry VI's uncle,
Thomas Seymour, who later married Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr. She received court-like educational opportunities until Catherine's death in September 1548. Under the tutelage of her well-respected mentors, Jane honed her intellect and refined her critical thinking skills, preparing herself for the intellectual rigors that laid ahead. Jane's association with the Seymour household exposed her to the turbulent currents of Tudor politics, as the machinations of power and ambition played out in the corridors of the castle. Witnessing firsthand the rise and fall of her uncle, Thomas Seymour, Jane gained valuable insights into the precarious nature of royal favor and the dangers of political intrigue. After Thomas Seymour's arrest for treason, Jane returned home to Bradgate to continue her studies. In the surroundings of Bradgate Manor, she continued to pursue her academic interests with fervor, devoting herself to the study of theology and philosophy. Despite the constraints imposed by her gender and social status, she refused to be confined by societal expectations, striving to carve out a place for herself in the male-dominated world of intellectual discourse. It was this unwavering commitment to learning and self-improvement that would ultimately define Jane's legacy as a scholar and thinker ahead of her time. On May 25th, 1553, Jane Grey found herself married to Lord Guildford Dudley, the wedding festivities unfolded in a whirlwind of pageantry and splendor, with Durham House ablaze with torches and festooned with tapestries depicting scenes of courtly romance. In a rare display of magnificence, the ceremony was part of a triple celebration, where Jane's sister Catherine married Lord Herbert, while Lord Guilford's sister married Henry Hastings, the heir to the illustrious Earl of Huntington. Little did Jane know that her union with Lord Guildford would soon catapult her into the heart of a political storm. Fast forward to the summer of 1553. With the untimely demise of the king on July 6th, Jane was informed of her unexpected elevation to the throne on July 9th, which she accepted very reluctantly. On the following day, Jane was formally proclaimed as the sovereign ruler of England, France, and Ireland, her coronation heralding a new dawn for the Tudor dynasty. However, Jane did not bestow the title of king to her husband, Guildford Dudley, deciding to wait for the approval of an act of parliament for his coronation. Northumberland faced the daunting task of consolidating power following King Edward's demise. His first move was to isolate Mary Tudor, recognizing her potential to rally support against his preferred successor, Lady Jane Grey. Despite Northumberland's efforts to apprehend Mary, his plans unraveled when the Privy Council, swayed by widespread popular backing, especially in Norfolk and Suffolk, where Northumberland had quelled rebellions, defected and proclaimed Mary Queen on July 19th. The shift in allegiance may have been orchestrated by Henry Fitzalan, 9th Earl of Arundel, who, having been previously detained by Northumberland, played a pivotal role in engineering the council's coup in his absence. Meanwhile, Lady Mary, informed of King Edward's failing health by Northumberland and Imperial ambassadors, swiftly mobilized support to assert her claim to the throne upon Edward's death. Northumberland, in a bid to bolster Lady Jane's ascension, delayed announcing King Edward's death, a move met with growing discontent in the streets of London. Mary's unwavering assertion of her rightful claim led to a tense standoff with the Privy Council, who, citing her illegitimacy, refused to recognize her as queen. However, Northumberland's failure to contain Mary's gathering support in East Anglia proved to be his undoing. With Mary amassing a formidable army at Framlingham Castle, swelling to nearly 20,000 by July 18th, the Privy Council, recognizing their grave miscalculation, swiftly proclaimed Mary Queen, thereby bringing an end to Jane's nine-day reign and igniting jubilation in the streets of London. In the aftermath of the dramatic reversal of fortunes, Northumberland found himself stranded in Cambridge, compelled to reluctantly acknowledge Mary as Queen under the Council's orders. Sensing the shifting political winds, Arundel and other allies sought Mary's pardon, while Arundel himself took action by arresting Northumberland. Facing the inevitable, 
Northumberland renounced Protestantism before meeting his fate at the Executioner's Block on August 22nd. The swift turn of events marked a tragic end for Northumberland, whose ambitions were dashed by the tidal wave of upheaval. On July 19, 1553, Jane was confined in the Tower of London, while her husband, Guildford, was held in the Beauchamp Tower. Jane, referred to as Jane Dudley, wife of Guildford, faced charges of high treason alongside her husband, two of his brothers, and the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Their trial, presided over by special commission, occurred November 13, 1553, at Guildhall in London. All were convicted, and Jane's guilt was evidenced by documents signed as Jane the Queen. Her sentence offered her the choice of burning alive on Tower Hill or beheading. Wyatt's rebellion in 1554 against Queen Mary's marriage to Philip of Spain sealed Jane's fate. Her father and uncles joining the rebellion prompted the government to uphold the verdict against Jane and Guildford. Initially scheduled for February 9, 1554, their execution was delayed for three days to allow Jane to convert to Catholicism. Though she did not yield to conversion efforts, she formed a bond with Mary's chaplain, John Feckenham, who accompanied her to the scaffold. Following the execution of Guildford on February 12, 1554, at Tower Hill, Jane Grey bore witness to her husband's lifeless body as it passed by her window in a cart, a reminder of the cruel fate that awaited her. The account of her final moments, as chronicled in the anonymous Chronicle of Queen Jane and of Two Years of Queen Mary, formed the basis for Raphael Holinshed's depiction of her execution. Jane gave a speech upon ascending to the scaffold. Good people, I am come hither to die, and by law I am condemned to the same. The fact, indeed, against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and the consenting thereunto by me. But touching the procurement and desire thereof by me or on my behalf, I do wash my hands thereof in innocence, before God, and the face of you, good Christian people, this day. After proclaiming her innocence, Jane recited Psalm 51 in English and handed her belongings to her maid. Granting forgiveness to the executioner, she urged for a swift end. Blindfolding herself, Jane struggled momentarily to locate the execution block likely aided by the compassionate assistance of Sir Thomas Bridges. In a swift, decisive stroke, the executioner's axe fell, and Jane's earthly journey came to a swift and dignified end. Following their executions, Jane and Guildford were laid to rest in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula on the north side of Tower Green, their graves left unmarked. The tragic fate of the Grey family continued to unfold with the Duke of Suffolk, Jane's father, meeting his own demise on February 23, 1554, just 11 days after his daughter's execution. In contrast, Jane's mother, the Duchess of Suffolk, remarried and received a full pardon from Queen Mary, eventually residing at court with her two surviving daughters until her passing in 1559. So that's the story of Edward and Jane. Let's rewind the clock a bit and talk about Mary. Mary Tudor, born on February 18, 1516, at the illustrious Palace of Placentia in Greenwich, England, emerged into the world as the much-anticipated offspring of King Henry VIII and his devoted first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Her arrival marked a beacon of hope in a lineage fraught with tragedy, as previous pregnancies had yielded naught but stillborns or fleeting sons. She received her early education from her mother and was known for her intelligence, displaying talents in music and languages at a young age. By nine, she could read and write in Latin, and was proficient in French, Spanish, and possibly Greek. Despite her father's affection, King Henry VIII's longing for a male heir cast a shadow over Mary's formative years. At the tender age of two, she was betrothed to Francis, Dauphin of France, a union that promised to unite the crowns of England and France in holy matrimony. Yet, like so many grand designs, this alliance crumbled beneath the weight of shifting alliances and political upheaval. Undeterred, Cardinal Worsley, the architect of Henry's court, embarked on a new gambit, brokering a match between Mary and her cousin, the formidable Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. 
this engagement was also broken off. Cardinal Wolseley then explored the possibility of a marriage with the French king, Francis I, but this plan did not materialize either. The discussions of a marriage between Mary and her cousin James V of Scotland also never came to fruition. As Mary entered adolescence, her parents' marriage faced challenges, which affected her own status. Henry VIII sought divorce of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, claiming it was unclean due to Catherine's previous marriage to Henry's brother, Arthur. The Pope's refusal to grant the divorce, influenced by Catherine's nephew, Charles V, led to Henry's break from the Catholic Church and the declaration of himself as the supreme head of the Church of England. Mary's relationship with her mother was strained, and after Anne Boleyn became queen, Mary was declared illegitimate and demoted to the Lady Mary. Her household was dissolved, and she was sent to join her infant half-sister Elizabeth's household at Hatfield Palace. Throughout this period, Mary struggled with health issues and emotional distress, possibly exacerbated by the tumultuous events surrounding her family and her own changing status. During the reign of Anne Boleyn, Mary staunchly refused to acknowledge Anne's status as queen or her half-sister Elizabeth's rightful claim to the title of princess, much to the annoyance of their father. Mary's unwavering defiance only served to aggravate her unstable position at court, where she found herself increasingly isolated and ostracized. Subjected to strict restrictions on her movements and frequently plagued with bouts of illness, Mary's physical and emotional well-being deteriorated under the strain of her treatment. Despite the valiant efforts of the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis to advocate on her behalf, Mary's situation remained unchanged. As the rift between Mary and her father widened, they didn't speak for three years. Mary was denied permission to visit Catherine, leaving Mary to grapple with her grief alone following her mother's death in 1536. Then, Anne Boleyn was executed, and Jane Seymour rose to the throne. With Jane's encouragement, Henry extended an olive branch to Mary, albeit under stringent conditions that tested the bounds of her conscience. She was required to acknowledge Henry's supremacy over the Church of England, renounce the validity of her parents' marriage, and accept her own status as illegitimate. Though she attempted to meet her father's demands to the extent permissible by her conscience, the relentless pressure eventually wore down her resistance, compelling her to yield to Henry's will. Reconciled with her father and reinstated at court, Mary's fortunes took a turn for the better as she regained her rightful place within royal circles. Bestowed with her own household and granted access to various royal residences, Mary embraced the trappings of courtly life with a newfound sense of purpose. While Mary reveled in her newfound sense of belonging, unrest brewed in the north of England, where rebels, including her former chamberlain, Lord Husey, rose up in protest against Henry's religious reforms. Although some clamored for Mary's legitimization as rightful heir to the throne, Mary herself remained aloof from the brewing rebellion, opting instead to focus on her duties and obligations as a member of the royal household. In a display of familial loyalty, Mary assumed the role of godmother to her half-brother Edward and stood as chief mourner at the funeral of Queen Jane Seymour in 1537. In late 1539, Philip, Duke of Bavaria, emerged as a potential match for marriage to Mary, only for his Lutheran faith to thwart any hopes of a union. Meanwhile, Henry's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, embarked on negotiations for a prospective alliance with the Duchy of Cleves, with Mary's name floated as a potential bride for William I, Duke of Cleves. However, the proposed match failed to materialize, ultimately paving the way for Henry's ill-fated union with Anne of Cleves. Cromwell's abrupt downfall and subsequent execution sent shockwaves through the court, with accusations of plotting to marry Mary himself, adding a sinister twist to the unfolding drama. In 1541, Henry executed Mary's old governess and godmother, the Countess of Salisbury, on dubious charges of Catholic plotting. The gruesome execution shocked many. 
Following the execution of Henry's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, Mary was invited to attend royal Christmas festivities and acted as hostess during her father's period without a consort. Henry's sixth and final wife, Catherine Parr, helped to bring the family closer together and led to Mary and Elizabeth being reinstated in the line of succession through the Act of Succession 1544, although they remained legally illegitimate. After Henry VIII's death in 1547, Henry VI succeeded him, and Mary inherited several estates. However, the Regency Council dominated by Protestants attempted to impose Protestantism throughout the country. Despite pressure to conform, Mary remained faithful to Roman Catholicism and sought diplomatic support from her cousin Emperor Charles V. During Edward's reign, Mary largely remained on her estates and clashed with him over religious matters, as he insisted she abandon Catholicism while she staunchly refused. Their differences culminated in a public confrontation during Christmas 1550, where Edward rebuked Mary for ignoring his religious laws, causing both to weep openly. Mary's steadfast adherence to Catholicism continued to be a point of contention throughout Edward's reign. I've already told you about how Edward VI excluded both Mary and Elizabeth from the line of succession in his will, and instead named Lady Jane Grey to succeed him. Before his death, Edward summoned Mary to London under the pretext of visiting him, but Mary was warned that it was a ploy to capture her and facilitate Jane's accession to the throne. As a result, Mary fled to East Anglia, where she had support among Catholic adherents and opponents of Northumberland. Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed queen, but nine days later, Mary was queen. Mary rode into London triumphantly on August 3, 1553, accompanied by her half-sister Elizabeth and a large procession of nobles and gentlemen amidst widespread popular support. Upon ascending the throne, one of Mary's initial acts was to release prominent Roman Catholics, including the Duke of Norfolk and Stephen Gardiner, from his imprisonment in the Tower of London. She also released her kinsman, Edward Courtenay. Recognizing Lady Jane's role as a pawn in Northumberland's scheme, Mary opted not to immediately execute her and her husband, Lord Guildford Dudley. Instead, they were kept under guard in the Tower. Mary faced a challenge as most Privy Councillors had been involved in the plot to place Lady Jane on the throne. To navigate this delicate situation, she appointed Gardiner to the council and bestowed upon him the positions of Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor. Gardiner played a significant role in Mary's government until his death in November 1555, including conducting Mary's coronation on October 1, 1553 at Westminster Abbey. At the age of 37, Mary sought a husband to produce an heir and prevent her Protestant half-sister Elizabeth from ascending the throne. Various suitors were considered, including Edward Courtenay and Reginald Pole, but Mary's cousin Charles V suggested his son Philip. Philip, heir apparent to vast territories in Europe and the New World, had been widowed and was available for marriage. Despite opposition from Lord Chancellor Gardiner and the English House of Commons, who feared English subjugation to the Habsburgs, Mary pursued the marriage. Insurrections broke out against the Union, notably Wyatt's Rebellion, led by Thomas Wyatt the Younger. Mary promised to submit the marriage to Parliament for approval. Although Wyatt was defeated and captured, the rebellion underscored the unpopularity of the match. Wyatt, Lady Jane Grey's father, and others were executed, while Courtenay was imprisoned and later exiled. Elizabeth, though implicated, was confined to house arrest. Mary's marriage to Philip of Spain posed significant challenges due to English common law doctrines and fears that any man she wed would effectively become King of England. To address these concerns, the terms of Queen Mary's Marriage Act stipulated that Philip would be styled, quote, King of England, end quote, during Mary's lifetime only, with limited powers and obligations. Philip agreed to these terms, primarily for political and strategic reasons, lacking any genuine affection for Mary. However, the Act's implementation faced challenges 
As Philip's presence stirred discontent among English nobles, wary of Spanish interference in domestic affairs. The wedding between Mary and Philip took place at Winchester Cathedral on the 25th of July, 1554, just two days after their first meeting. Philip could not speak English, so despite the language barrier, the ceremony proceeded with a mixture of Spanish, French, and Latin. Mary's apparent pregnancy in September 1554 led to widespread belief at court that she was expecting a child. Parliament even passed an act making Philip regent in the event of Mary's death during childbirth. However, the pregnancy turned out to be false, leading to disappointment and embarrassment. Rumors and speculation persisted until July 1555, when it became evident that Mary was not pregnant. This false pregnancy, likely induced by Mary's fervent desire for a child, ended in August, coinciding with Philip's departure to command his armies against France and Flanders. Mary, deeply saddened by the turn of events, fell into a profound depression. Elizabeth remained at court until October, seemingly restored to favor after her earlier house arrest. However, Philip of Spain, concerned about the succession of the English throne in the absence of any children, proposed that Elizabeth marry his cousin, Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy. The aim was to secure the Catholic succession and maintain the Habsburg influence in England. However, Elizabeth refused to agree to the match, and parliamentary consent was unlikely. Upon her accession, Mary initially proclaimed religious tolerance, but within a month, prominent Protestant leaders were imprisoned. Mary's first parliament, convened in October, validated her parents' marriage and repealed the Protestant religious laws established during Edward's reign. The English church was returned to Roman jurisdiction, with doctrines reverting to those outlined in Henry VIII's Six Articles of 1539 including the reaffirmation of clerical celibacy. Rejecting her father's break with Rome and her brother's Protestant reforms, Mary, influenced by Philip, sought to restore Catholicism in England. Parliament repealed Henry's religious laws, marking a significant shift back to Catholicism. The return to Roman jurisdiction was finalized after months of negotiation, with the Pope's approval attained by the end of 1554. The revival of the Heresy Acts led to the persecution of Protestants, with around 800 fleeing into exile. The executions of prominent Protestant figures, including John Rogers, Lawrence Saunders, Roland Taylor, and John Hooper, marked the onset of a brutal crackdown on religious dissent, with the flames of persecution consuming all who dared to defy the dictates of Catholic orthodoxy. Even Thomas Cranmer, the once revered Archbishop of Canterbury, was not spared from the merciless hand of persecution. Forced to recant his Protestant beliefs before ultimately meeting his demise at the stake. In total, roughly 283 individuals were executed, mostly by burning at the stake, contributing to widespread public outrage and discontent. Mary's relentless pursuit of religious conformity earned her the infamous epithet of Bloody Mary, a moniker that would come to epitomize her reign of terror in the annals of English history. The executions of Protestant dissenters, carried out with ruthless efficiency, cast a dark shadow over Mary's rule, staining her legacy with the blood of martyrs and only served to fan the flames of dissent, sowing the seeds of future discord and rebellion. The legacy of Bloody Mary would endure as a cautionary tale of the perils of religious fanaticism and the fragility of religious tolerance in the face of unchecked power. Reginald Pole, Mary's cousin and the son of her executed governess, arrived as a papal legate in November 1554. His elevation to the Archbishopric of Canterbury following the execution of Thomas Cranmer marked a pivotal moment in the resurgence of Catholic authority within England with Pole playing a pivotal role in shaping the religious landscape of the nation. In January 1556, Emperor Charles V abdicated while Mary and Philip were still separated. Philip was declared King of Spain in Brussels. Meanwhile, Philip negotiated an unstable truce with France in February 1556. 
However, tensions escalated when Henry Dudley, a second cousin of the executed Duke of Northumberland, attempted to assemble an invasion force in France, implicating the French ambassador in England. This conspiracy, known as the Dudley Conspiracy, was exposed, leading to the arrest of conspirators in England. Dudley fled to exile in France, and the French ambassador also wisely left Britain. Philip returned to England from March to July 1557 to persuade Mary to support Spain in a renewed conflict against France. While Mary was inclined to declare war, her advisors opposed it due to concerns about jeopardizing French trade, violating provisions of the marriage treaty, and England's financial constraints resulting from the economic difficulties of Edward VI's reign and poor harvests. War was ultimately declared in 1557, following an invasion attempt by Thomas Stafford, Reginald Pole's nephew, who seized Scarborough Castle with French assistance in a failed bid to depose Mary. The conflict strained relations between England and the papacy, as Pope Paul IV was allied with Henry II of France. Despite initial setbacks, English forces achieved victory in the Battle of St. Quentin in August, but the triumph was short-lived. In January 1558, French forces captured Calais, England's last possession on the European mainland, dealing a significant blow to Mary's prestige. The loss of Calais was deeply personal for Mary who, in a possible apocryphal remark, said, When I am dead and opened, you shall find Calais lying in my heart. During Queen Mary's reign, England grappled with a myriad of economic challenges that tested the resilience of the realm. Adverse weather conditions characterized by incessant rainfall wrought havoc upon the countryside, triggering widespread flooding and exacerbating existing woes of famine and scarcity. The agricultural sector, upon which England's economy heavily relied, bore the brunt of these natural calamities, plunging the populace into deeper distress. The downturn in the Antwerp cloth trade dealt a severe blow to England's economic fortunes, further compounding the nation's fiscal woes. The decline of this vital commercial artery not only undermined England's position in the lucrative European marketplace, but also heightened concerns over the sustainability of the economy. Despite Mary's marriage to Philip of Spain, England found itself on the periphery of Spain's burgeoning trade empire. The Spanish, protective of their lucrative trade routes and wary of encroachment upon their economic interests, rebuffed English attempts to tap into the riches of the New World. Mary, bound by her allegiance to her husband and the diplomatic imperatives of her marriage, was compelled to restrain English activities that infringed upon Spanish trade interests, therefore foreclosing avenues for potential economic gain. In response to the pressing need for economic revitalization, Mary's government embarked on a quest for new commercial horizons. Royal patronage was extended to the Muscovy Company, granting them a charter to facilitate trade ventures in distant lands. Concurrently, Efforts were undertaken to chart uncharted waters and explore potential trade routes through the commissioning of a world atlas, signaling a concerted effort to diversify England's economic portfolio and expand its commercial reach. However, the financial management of Mary's regime grappled with the formidable challenge of reconciling medieval taxation systems with the demands of modern governance. Revenue collection, overseen by the capable stewardship of William Paulette, encountered obstacles stemming from the failure to levy tariffs on emerging imports, thereby squandering opportunities for revenue generation. Despite earnest endeavors to institute currency reforms, the implementation thereof languished in bureaucratic inertia, impeding the efficiency of fiscal policy and hindering efforts to bolster the nation's coffers. In May 1558, as whispers of her failing health echoed through the halls, Mary's grip on the throne began to falter, signaling the inexorable march towards the end of an era. On November 17, 1558, amidst the grip of an influenza epidemic that spread across the land, Mary breathed her last. The precise nature of the illness that killed her remains a mystery, with guesses ranging from ovarian cysts to uterine cancer. Regardless of the exact diagnosis, 
Mary's passing marked the end of an era and heralded a new dawn for England. With Mary's death, the stage was set for the rise of her half-sister, Elizabeth I, whose indomitable spirit and keen intellect would come to define an era of unprecedented cultural and political change. The transition of power, symbolized by Mary's burial alongside Elizabeth in the halls of Westminster Abbey, served as a touching reminder of the repeating nature of history and the relentless passage of time. The complex relationship of the reigns between Edward VI, Lady Jane Grey, and Mary I represents a fundamental chapter in English history. Characterized by a chaotic blend of religious fervor, political maneuvering, and shifting power dynamics, Edward's relatively brief yet impactful reign epitomized a period of radical Protestant reform as he, guided by influential figures such as Thomas Cranmer, pushed forward sweeping changes in religious doctrine and practice. Under his rule, the Church of England underwent significant transformation with the introduction of doctrinal reforms and the consolidation of Protestant ideology, laying the groundwork for the religious landscape of subsequent generations. The brief ascension of Lady Jane Grey to the throne, orchestrated by ambitious figures seeking to maintain Protestant hegemony, serves as a poignant reminder of the precariousness of power transitions during this volatile era. During her brief reign, Lady Jane's legacy endures as a symbol of political intrigue and the complexities of royal succession, highlighting the delicate balance of power and tenuous nature of legitimacy in Tudor England. In stark contrast, Mary I's rise to the throne marked a dramatic reversal of her brother's Protestant reforms as she sought to restore Catholicism to England with unwavering determination. Mary's commitment to her faith earned her the infamous title Bloody Mary as her reign was marred by the harsh persecution of Protestants and dissenters. Despite her efforts to enforce religious orthodoxy and restore papal authority, Mary faced formidable opposition and enduring challenges underscoring the inherent complexities of religious reforms and political governments in 16th century England. Collectively, the reigns of Edward VI, Lady Jane Grey, and Mary I encapsulate a transformative period in English history. Their legacies, fraught with controversy and complexity, continue to shape scholarly discourse and historical understanding, reflecting the enduring significance of their reigns in the broader narrative of England's past. As we reflect on their tumultuous era, we are reminded of the enduring legacy of the Tudor monarchs and the profound impact of their reigns on the course of English history. And so ends today's episode. Thank you very much to the books The Children of Henry VIII by Alison Ware and The Tudors by Peter Ackroyd for all the research help, as well as the countless websites I've hit up for information. I hope to have you listen in to my next episode, I'm thinking possibly America's original 13 colonies. You can find me on my Facebook page, ADHD History, and on Twitter, Blue Sky, Threads, Instagram, and YouTube at It's ADHD History. See you next time. Adios.